Good afternoon and welcome to this series of CTSnet roundtable discussions at EACS in Amsterdam. My name is Leanne Harling and I'm here with Professor Westerby and Dr. Mack to discuss the hotly debated topic of surgeon-specific mortality reporting. Thank you very much for joining us today. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I thought perhaps we could begin by talking about how all of this came about in the first place um, and how we got into the situation that we're in now where it's probably this is one of the most highly hotly debated topics in cardiac surgery at the moment. It was all the Americans' fault, so I'm <laughs> going to let Michael get started with that. So back in the 1980s, um, uh, the precursor to Medicare, uh, which was called HICFA in the United States, uh, started gathering data and analyzing center-to-center -center data in terms of outcomes. Uh, it turned out they were using no risk adjustment. There was no way to compare apples to apples. So the professional societies, namely the Society of Thoracic Surgeon, got involved and started the STS database so that we could collect um, risk-adjusted outcomes and therefore have a clinically meaningful comparison. Um, so we had this wealth of data and information available, and uh, there were multiple other uh, consumer uh, sources out there of information that were making uh, either invalid assessments or, um, or, or bogus assessments, to be honest with you. So the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, uh, in their wisdom, decided that as long as people were reporting on us anyway, uh, we probably should become engaged uh, with this process. And the Society partnered with Consumer Reports uh, to uh, po to uh, perform public reporting of outcomes in the United States. Uh, it's voluntary in the United States now, and about half of the centers and surgeons have agreed uh, to for public reporting by a center experience uh, right now. Uh, but there is continual pressure for individual patient reporting. There are five uh, states in the United States that do publish outcomes uh, based upon their own databases of individual surgeon, but nationally it's voluntary and by institution. Mm. Michael, you were president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing that tie in honor of yourself right now. Isn't it true that in 2007 uh, the Society became very concerned about the reporting of individual surgeons' death rates and recommended against it? And then the American College of Cardiology, when they were faced with the same uh, issue for angioplasty, also gave very specific warnings that when you uh, pinpoint an individual, uh, it's not always uh, what you're going to get. Uh, and, and that is correct. And the reason that we insisted on staying with center-specific uh, mortality is that by the time you get down to the individual surgeon level, uh, it's hard to get a, a meaningful number that mm. you can rely on. So to get a statistically significant difference in performance, that, uh, and, and, to, and, for, and even if it is statistically significant, to be clinically mm. meaningful is a long, long stretch. Mm. And to get there from, uh, from an individual surgeon standpoint um, is virtually impossible mm. to do. As you know, one of my... Uh, standpoints is that infrastructure and consistency of teamwork uh, and factors such as that are, are very important. And one thing that really interested me was, was that in 1996, I think it was, you had in New York State's registry, uh, New York University very high in the rankings and Bellevue uh, Hospital very low in the rankings and they were the same surgeons operating in both facilities. Uh, and I think that highlighted for me uh, the, the uh, very profound influence that e equipment, uh, infrastructure, and so on has in this whole business. Uh, and it says to me that this is not a level playing field. So if you're going to report individual surgeons' outcomes, you have to try and make it a level playing field otherwise uh, you're comparing apples with oranges so uh, you you raise a couple of excellent points there uh, and you know the first is the accuracy of the data and uh, at least and uh, the uh, professional societies have gone to great lengths to be sure that uh, 
uh, the data is audited for both completeness uh, and accuracy. And no registry is ever going to be completely accurate, uh, but it's getting better and better all the time. Mm -hmm. The second, as you know from our debate this morning, uh, is that I agree with you that we work in an ecosystem, mm -hmm. and you have to take a holistic approach uh, uh, to it because an individual surgeon performance to a large degree is based upon factors all the way from preoperative selection to interoperative team to postoperative care, et cetera. So it's hard to look at just surgical performance outside of the whole mm -hmm. environment. Well, I, I think that after the New York surgical registries uh, and uh, the risk averse behavior that was described, uh, one of your great figures in healthcare, Donald Berwick, uh, said that institutions had to take responsibility for outcomes uh, and not individuals. And I, I agree uh, for what it's worth 100% with that. And then when we started having very profound problems with the British National Health Service, uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, invited Donald Berwick to come and look at our institutions and try and work out uh, why some of them were performing very badly. And at the end of his uh, examination of the NHS uh, and the hospitals that were not doing well, Berwick said, again, uh, it's institutions that have to take responsibility. In the NHS, uh, the surgeons working in those institutions can't influence uh, what, what really goes on. Uh, and then, having made that recommendation, in less than a month, the, uh, the, the British institution published individual surgeons' death rates for virtually every specialty. Uh, they weren't listening. And now I think we have a, a situation in the UK where we have an extremely defensive, risk-averse cardiac surgical profession that is disadvantaging uh, the patients. Um, High-risk surgery, innovative surgery is beginning to suffer, as is training, because no one wants to uh, allow a trainee to do a case that goes wrong. Uh, and, and innovation is, is now out the window, and I, I'm very worried about that, Michael. But you saw some of that in the U.S., I'm sure. So, uh, you know, I think you bring up a couple of very important points right there. Um, you would want to believe that uh, total transparency and public reporting would be nothing but a good thing. Mm. But there is a dark side to it and, and concerns about it. Does it promote risk-averse behavior? Well, when public reporting first happened in, the, uh, in New York State, in the United States, uh, the Cleveland Clinic uh, uh, has said uh, that it's the best marketing they ever had because of the mm -hmm. out-migration of patients from New York State to the Cleveland Clinic to have surgery. Yeah. Because not only on an individual surgeon basis, mm -hmm. but on an institutional basis, mm -hmm. they were very concerned about re reported outcomes. Um, the second part, and that was a, a revelation to me this morning, is that it seems to me you're much more at the mercy of the system uh, in the UK than we are in the United States. As you know from this morning, I felt very strongly that um, we're the captain of the ship and we're responsible for everything that happens, but we do have more autonomy and more ability to change the ecosystem around us than mm -hmm. it sounds like uh, you do. So I gained a new appreciation for the mm -hmm. ecosystem that you work in and why you have such concerns about not being able to change, or there's things beyond your control that you cannot influence or change that I think we perhaps have an advantage mm -hmm. for. Well, you know, the, the one thing that we have in common is that we're on the patient's side so discarding patients from care is, is something that neither of us want. So I just wanted to explore risk-averse behavior a little more. Uh, I wrote an article in the BMJ saying that I, I felt that the environment around me was becoming risk-averse and that the younger surgeons were under stress and that stress affected behavior and empathy. Now. I then uh, started to look at the relationships between uh, stress and risk-averse behavior, 
and found very quickly a, a very important study from Cambridge University that looked at financial traders in times of economic stress. Uh, and they found that the financial traders were risk-averse at the time when they should have been more adventurous to get the markets back on keel. So they measured blood cortisol, and the stressed risk tra traders had high cortisol levels. Then they did a study uh, getting uh, the financial uh, marketeers to do various tests and gave them cortisol, and cortisol changed their behavior, made them risk-averse. So I, I would submit that uh, risk-averse behavior is not a career choice. It's a stress response. And stress is not a good thing uh, when you're, we're talking about surgical performance. It's better to be relaxed. It's, it's better to be able to think. And I would put it to you that it's, it's better not to have the elephant in the consulting room. When you sit with a patient and think, am I going to operate on this patient? Uh, uh, the elephant in the consulting room I is telling you uh, if you do that and he dies, high-risk patient, then you're in trouble. And I I I'm afraid to say I, I think this whole thing has affected surgeons' behavior in an unprofessional way. So I don't think we suffer from the same degree of stress in the United mm -hmm. States from, from that standpoint. And what I would say is Shining a light on this has allowed us to look in eminent detail at every single aspect of the process. So I would, I don't approach a patient uh, uh, looking as to how to avoid an operation in them, but looking at is surgery the best treatment for them? Is this the right time for surgery? Is there a way we can optimize treatment better? in order to maximize the chance of success, and not only survival, but a functional quality of life and returning to their own <clears throat> environment previously. We also have undertaken programs where there are some surgeons that do some operations better than others. I believe you alluded to this morning mm -hmm. that you, you are, a, as a senior surgeon, uh, uh, probably it's in the patient's best interest to have a more complex reoperative patient taken care of by you. So we find ourselves doing that a lot mm. more in order to maximize it. But maybe I should check my cortisol level before I go into the <laughs> operating room, but I don't think <laughs> that I'm stressed worrying about what the public outcome reporting of this patient is going to be. Shall I tell you why you're less stressed? Because our environments are very different. Uh, I had the privilege of training with Dr. Kirkland, as you mm. know, and I'm on your side of the Atlantic quite frequently. And one thing I notice is the difference between your facilities, the consistency of your teams. Uh, I, I imported physicians' assistants back to the UK uh, because of the team consistency issue. But right now, we can't perform in the same way that you can. And I think at this, this EACS meeting, there have been lots of sessions on outcomes and there have been lots of sessions on mechanical circulatory support and ECMO and the two go together. Now in the UK only the transplant centers are funded for circulatory assist equipment. Uh, I did an awful lot with circulatory assist equipment using charitable money but when the charitable money ran out patients who I used to save just died because I had nothing to right. offer them. So I would put it to you that if we're going to compare surgeons' outcomes, we have to have that level playing field. And it, it's just not responsible for a government organization to say, look, we're going to publish your death rates, but sorry, we can't afford for you to have ECMO and everything that goes along with it. And I've just heard in one of the sessions that uh, uh, an ECMO event, if you like, costs between 200000 and $250,000, but you can save a patient. You can save half of the post-cardiotomy patients. Uh, and in, in a hospital in the UK, just two weeks ago, uh, a patient wouldn't come off bypass. Uh, they put in ECMO, the right heart uh, wasn't gonna recover. They did a total artificial heart, and the patient will be transplanted. Now, that unit has the equipment to salvage their patients. 
My unit does not have that equipment. It's not a level playing field. So ho publish hospital data. And if there, there are differences in hospital data, go in and find out what the differences are. Uh, we, we all watch each other. And in every unit, we police each other. Um, but uh, my belief is that that should be done internally. Pushing it out into the public arena had problems in the US in the 80s and 90s. You seem to have got over that now, but I don't see that we have in the UK. So, Leanna, we took 20 minutes for your first question. What's your <laughs> second question? <laughs> well, uh, uh, interesting taking from another perspective, thinking about it from, you mentioned training, from the trainee's perspective. I think uh, as a trainee myself and coming into it, there certainly is that, that feeling of, a bit of fear, particularly for those of those trainees that are coming to the end of their, their registrar job, starting as new consultants, as to how they're going to be analysed and what to do, whether they should start joint operating with the more senior consultants in the early days to kind of cover themselves in those early phases, how patients are going to think of them as new surgeons when they don't have that background that people can look f look at. W what should trainees do you in this that, situation when they're starting? That's a very sad comment. And what we have that you don't have, Michael, is European working time directive. So mm -hmm. our, our trainees are restricted to 48 hours a week. I believe in the States it, it, it's around about 90. 80. 80. But we heard this morning in, in one of the other sessions that uh, trainees should have done at least 200 coronary bypass operations themselves. Uh, and, and I think the more of those they do individually without, without um, somebody sitting on their shoulder, the better, the more confidence they'll have. But I think you just heard that the situation is now very, very difficult in the UK because a lot of the surgeons that are meant to be training uh, are, are now too afraid to do so because of their own reputations. So the trainees are suffering. So when I interviewed for a surgery residency in Houston, actually, I was told the call was every other night. And the way we view that is that way you only miss half of the good cases. Uh, and I think we have gone to extremes now with work rules uh, in place. And there's a whole lot of legitimate reasons for that. But the surgical hands-on experience is not nearly as great. Then you add this factor onto it about uh, decreasing the margin of error to the absolute minimum further impairs the ability to train. I think if you factor in the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours to excel in anything that you do, it takes a lot longer to get to 10,000 mm -hmm. hours and become a master surgeon uh, in order to do that. So to compensate that for what we find is we are spending a lot more time and a lot more effort post-training uh, in terms of mentoring for the first number of years afterwards. Uh, we used to take the approach that you're a fully trained surgeon, uh, throw you in the deep end of the pool, and I think you can swim just fine. And we realized that that probably is not in the patient's best interest, uh, that we can do a more gradual, graduated approach. And I think the reality is this is the environment we're working in is not going to go away. And so we continually need to find the best way to train surgeons. Uh, I think simulators have some role, but it's a very limited role. Uh, but having a graduated experience of being able to um, uh, have the experience of operating, but still protecting the patient's rights. Thank you. I, I think there's one thing we both agree on, that collecting data can improve performance, that presenting data to the public can increase confidence, uh, but it can also decrease confidence. And if you present a list of names of outliers, whether it's you know, the lowest mortality or the highest mortality, uh, it's very, very difficult for the patients to understand what they're looking at. And I, as I say, I made the point this morning that if I wasn't in the higher mortality surgeon bracket, I wouldn't be doing my job because uh, there, there has to be a group of experienced surgeons that take on the difficult cases and so on and so forth. 
And it's unreasonable to say, well, uh, the most urgent cases are excluded from the databases or the redos uh, are excluded from the databases. We all have to do very difficult cases that are included. And it makes no sense to make your on-the-edge surgeons risk-averse. That's very bad for the public. So we have to find, in my view, a middle ground. Um, I, I just get the feeling within uh, the UK society right now, we haven't found the middle ground. Um, the stakeholders have to have an opportunity to say uh, what they feel about it. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine article recently said you only get good performance in healthcare when you involve the stakeholders. If you impose things on characters like cardiac surgeons, predictably you don't always get the result that uh, you would want. We have to do the best for the patients. Now, are the patients in America looking at uh, the hospitals and uh, the surgeons and deciding where to go? The short answer to that is probably yes, and, and the patterns changed when you published uh, the best hospitals and the worst hospitals. But the British patient is nailed to the nearest centre. They have no option. So they're getting a lot of data that very few of them understand, and they're not in a position to make choices. And I think that's the difference between our, our, our systems. And as long as we keep the patient in focus, uh, instead of worrying about ourselves, we'll be okay. But I, I, I fear that uh, stress uh, uh, causes lack of empathy. Well, it's true that misinformation is worse than no information at all, and there's a ton of misinformation out there. As we heard Michael Borger say this morning, when you have real valid information, it's all how you display it and educate the patient, or the consumer on it, uh, so that that mean is meaningful. So after this discussion, are you still interested in going into thoracic surgery and completing your training? Of course, of course. Um, but so. Where do we go from now, though? How do we make it? How do we fix it? Is, do you have a? What's the solution, in your opinion, at this point in time? How do we take it forward you know, to make things better? I think we should bounce that back to you. <laughs> you you've been talking to a couple of old fogies, with respect. <laughs> it's your it's your future that we're considering here. Uh, can you face uh, a lifetime of scrutiny and defensive practice? And was that what you came into surgery to do, to watch your own back? It's not. You came into medicine and surgery to do a good job for the patient. But you're being pushed into a corner. And this is what I hear uh, day after day after day. Uh, and there have been quite a, a few British cardiac surgeons that have lost their livelihoods because of this. So there is stress uh, and there is self-preservation. And we need to get back to focusing on the patient. Absolutely. So you get the final word. How are we going to fix it? I couldn't agree with you more. I think, yeah, the patient is the focus. And that's what we all went into it for. So we need to readdress and go back and look, look back, to, back to the past to go forward to the future, I think. Thank you very much. We should make a movie out of that. <laughs> Thank you. A very fine discussion. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael, for coming across oh. to EX and doing a very good job for My us. My pleasure. Mm. Stephen, good to see you again. Yeah, thank you very Thank much you for both. asking us to do this. Thank you.